Hello, podcast listeners. This is your host with the most, JJ. I'm meeting another new person today in an interview episode of JJ Meets World. You're going to meet Elisa. And uh, I, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to see if I can find Tucker this caricature, and we're going to share it on our social media. So you might want to go see that first just to get a feel for what you're going to get into in this episode. But sit back, relax, and enjoy. And by the way, if you'd like to help support our podcast, visit JJMeetsWorld.com where you can donate to our Patreon pick up some killer swag at our merch shop, or click the link to Apple Podcast and give us a five-star review. One, two, three, four. JJ Gordon, sort of like that Indiana Jones in that he's always snipping out his next adventure. Yes, he is! He's always interviewing guests so he can have them on his show and they can talk about pop culture, arts, and leisure. JJ has his flag unfurled and he likes his french fries curled and he's fun and then he twirls as he goes to meet the world. He will march into the rain even if his ankle sprain. Take a peek inside his brain. This podcast is called JJ Meets World. Elisa, it's good to have you in the studio. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Uh, so let's start by just introducing yourself a little bit to our listeners and what it is that you do. Um, Well, my name's Elisa. I am owner and operator of Alley Cat Studios. We uh, provide um, professional caricature artists, airbrush tattoo artists. That's for like live live event entertainment stuff, like different stuff like corporations, cities, um, Chamber of Commerce. I've gotten some stuff from them. They basically hire us to like come and entertain their guests. I feel like you and I have been at the same post proms before. Oh, that's my that's my jam every every year. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen (laughs) you doing the caricatures for the kids at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's like the start of the season, and then it just like rolls through (laughs) until the winter. Uh, it's a, it's a weird thing, I think, to, uh, entertain someone at an hour of the night that you normally aren't like, yeah, let's have some fun. Let's, <laughs> my creative juices are really flowing here at three 30 in Enderlin, <laughs> right? But, uh, it's, it's something fun. So, you know, I do like improv entertainment mm-hmm. and I'm pretty sure I have seen you at some post proms yeah. over the years. Uh, but it's, a, it's something unique, right? So. Uh, I've seen companies have photo booths all the time and that's fine for what it is, but we all have photo, you know, we all have cameras on our phone. You get to bring in this artistic endeavor into it. Uh, what do you find most people uh, are excited about when they see their caricature for the first time? That's an interesting question. And let's, it's, let's also define caricature as well. Um, well, um, an incredibly notable um, caricaturist that most people be familiar with is Tom Richman. He was like the main like caricature artist for Mad Magazine, and he wrote a book, and I think he uh, described it the most accurate way. Um, a caricature is like a portrait with the volume turned up. <laughs> oh, so, wow. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, the whole idea is like um, it's a whole process when someone sits, like you're immediately like looking at them, talking to them, interacting with them, and... Uh, you like notice their mannerisms. You notice the way they smile. If they make a joke, if there's things they're focused on, you kind of just kind of take the essence of each individual and try to render that on paper, which can be um, sometimes tricky. Uh, it can be kind of tricky, but other times it's just uh, just like hits you. Um, so like if I show up and I'm wearing a Minnesota Twins that's jersey, a gimme. that's a gimme. Boom, done, easy, right? Easy. Yeah. Uh, but I walk up and I'm drinking a white claw and wearing a fedora, <laughs> but all I'm talking about is the stock market. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That would what be, do you a, do with that? be really fun. <laughs> um, I'd probably put you in a stuffy, I'd probably put you in a stuffy stu- suit. I'd probably make you look pretty wasted while you're talking about the Dow or oh, something like a little word bubble for the Dow or you, whatever. You nailed it. <laughs> Done. Um, I think it's, it, it's gotta be really fun to be able to kind of not make a snap judgment on someone, but to like be able to read someone that quickly, you I know, suppose. that's, it, I mean, it's a superpower to some extent. Um, I guess, um, well, just observe, I really enjoy, um, observing people. Um, I'm, uh, going into, uh, the field of like, I'm going to be an art therapist. So like, I've got the art degree. I almost, I got like three more classes and that's done at the end of the semester, but, um, I'll be getting a master's in, uh, general counseling and then I'll be an art therapist. So like I've been studying the human mind ever since I was in uh, uh, sophomore year of high school is when I started going to the psych classes. So yeah, I guess every person that sits in front of me, I kind of analyze right away and kind of break them down. 
I probably shouldn't be saying that. I'm no, a little no. nervous to sit in my chair. No. It's, not, it's not like I can read your mind or I anything. mean, but that's what we're asking for, right? Like the the unspoken contract is I'm sitting down and I'm expecting you to. I mean, have you ever had someone who like looks at it and goes like, that's not me, and then rips it up in front of you and makes confetti? Um, When I, okay, so I started in 2006 at the West Acres Mall. It was the end of a contract that was there um, by a couple of artists from the cities and they were hiring artists here. They started me, um, they initially were training me. I've been drawing since I was a kid, but learning how to draw caricatures is very different um, than a lot of other like disciplines in art. So um, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was great, I wasn't great. Okay. I would say that. I wasn't great. I was passable. Um, but uh, people in North Dakota are so very polite and very nice. And I was able to sell a lot of things that I honestly, I don't think I would have. Um, I wouldn't try to sell sell my work. Like then. looking back well, at like, it now, you're like, That's Oof. like 16 years ago. I've been doing this for a really long time now. But that was just my start. And then I uh, moved to Minneapolis and I got my first return um, at the Mall of America. And it wasn't because I didn't have a likeness or a poor quality or whatever. Well, it, it was because um, she thought I was making fun of her teeth. And it was, a, it was a guy and a girl. They had to have been like early, early 20s, maybe late teens. And the guy like loved it, laughed. Um, they bought the drawing protector and all of that stuff, gave me a really good tip. And then about a half hour later, um, the guy comes back looking like very like nervous and sad and it's just like you can see his girlfriend like a couple yards back with her arms crossed just like looking at me giving me like the stink eye really hard and he's just like i'm i'm really sorry but i, I have to return this um you uh my my girlfriend's teeth aren't that big um and uh <laughs> <laughs> I did. I wasn't. Her, that's how her teeth literally looked. I was not making fun of her teeth, but um, I was just like, well, I was working for somebody. I I was being professional. It's like, okay, for sure. So I gave him a refund on that, and then he had he asked for the tip back too. Oh. <laughs> I even took the tip back. Oh, that's that's ouch. But I, that is the absolute only time that I've ever had anybody be rude about the caricature they received. I mean, was there, there was no like, could we do, have a redo? No, she was very upset about mm. her teeth and she didn't trust me to render her the way that she was looking for. There was a portrait studio on the east side of the mall that she could have gone through for like, um, well, her teeth would have still been like a lifelike big. drawing, but then the teeth would still be big. So yeah, well, she could have she could have asked. That happens with being a caricature artist. Like a lot of people sit down like, OK, don't make fun of my teeth. Don't make fun of my chin. Um can you make my cheekbones bigger? Can you make my boobs bigger? Like there's a lot, like people will try to edit and tell me what to do. And it really just depends on the contract. Sure. <laughs> yeah. No, if I'm, more... I'm supposed, I suppose part of it's supposed to be like, it's supposed to be fun and they are paying for a product. Right. And so you're, you gotta do that. But like, let the artists do what they do best, right? I wouldn't tell a contractor, like, listen, are you using torque screws? Because I only want Brad nails. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I think it's just like I don't think anybody's trying to be rude at all. I usually everybody that sits in my chair are very, very like nice to interact with. I think what it is is like when you sit down and you have somebody looking at you and like and then I stare at you. Like I, I stare at you. It's like kind of be kind of intimidating. Earlier, <laughs> earlier a lot of like, people like pretending not to make eye contact and be like, oh, look at that thing on my jeans. Uh. <laughs> and that's the thing is like, stare right at me and don't move. And um, when I first started out, it was even more intimidating because it took a lot longer to look at a person and get the likeness in my head. Like the first one I ever did, those poor, it was two uh, college girls. The poor girls were probably sitting there for like a good half hour, like smiling, just holding a smile, <laughs> staying really happy, staying like this. And, uh, and then I was just looking at them like, just... You're like, it's not, a, it's like, not a Civil really War photo. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I was staring at him like I was at the, uh, I was holding the gun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it was very, it's very intimidating. But like, after I've been doing it for so long, I can just like kind of glance and catch likeness quicker. So it's not such an intense, uh, mm -hmm. intense like stare. Um, and that's made it a lot easier on people, but it was, yeah, when I, when I couldn't catch a likeness and like a quick glance or like start talking to him, get the look from there, it was, uh kind of an awkward situation for everybody involved but ultimately they had fun so uh i think that so did you end up keeping the portrait from the or did you throw the couple's no, I threw portrait it away. away you know really what probably happened was they went to the rainforest cafe and they're like it's going to be a 45 minute wait and she was like i want to bahama mama now and they're like well there's no seating at the bar and she's like that portrait is bullshit <laughs> And so there was probably something else or Gap denied a return that day. Uh, I mean, the yeah. fact that they were gone for so long 
makes me think that there is something else happening in the MOA that day. You know, I never thought about it like that. You know, when I was when I used to work as a server for like like through my, through college, my first round and everything like and that's that's where I would catch that. That's where um, if I'm having a really bad day, here's this person and I'm better than them. So I'm going to be like kind of rude or whatever. They kind of get like their uh, their inner uh, their inner like problems. If they're mad at their sister or whatever, like they just get more aggressive with people that they feel like they can mm-hmm. get away with that. People don't pull that with me because they know I'm drawing them, I think. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. That most people, it's just like, I really like where I work because like, I don't know if it's just because of what I'm doing, but like I draw people who are just like happy and they want to have a good time and they smile and, and it, it's like generally really funny and a very good experience. Like it, I don't know, it, it draws out like a really good quality in people or it, it it's just, it hasn't been, like, it was really that time I'm telling you was the one. The one time. The one time. Most anybody I've ever drawn has been lovely, very kind, very kind. So uh, I think it's funny, though, that, like, you had that at the drop of a hat, though. Like, that that couple still is just sitting there in your psyche somewhere. Oh, oh it's there. It's in there. And, I mean, did it intimidate you? Did you draw smaller teeth for a while? Were you like, oh, I got to tone it down on the old mandibles? <laughs> Um, it's kind of changed throughout my career and it's had a lot to do with what I'm doing. Like, um, I, I draw a lot for, um, companies or, um, d- you know, city of, um, city events and stuff like that. And there I am working on the behest of people. So they know they're hiring a characterist. They know the characterist is going to make fun of features and stuff. But if I see a person who has like very like, um, obvious, um, exam exaggerated or on, um, not, maybe not, a aligned features or something like that and you can tell i can tell when i'm looking at them are they just like make fun of me are they just like kind of like holding their smile a little bit they don't want me to see their teeth they don't want to like give me their big smile or they're like kind of putting their face at an angle you can tell that they're they're just not in a space where they want to be really exaggerated or made fun of and i abide by that and i do that for people because they're at their company event they're at their city event or whatever to have fun so that's how i that's so in that in that context, I definitely, I go for a likeness. I go for a gag. Um, and if the person is very obviously wants to be made fun of or something, then I can just like totally go for it. But other than that, it's going to be, it's going to be a little more, um, it's just going to be a little more tempered. Um, if I'm doing my own stuff, like I don't, I don't really vend much anymore, but if I do, then I have a lot more time with people. I can get to know them more. I can talk to them more. I can understand like, okay, they're actually here to have like a lot of fun. They're investing this money. Like they, their, their company isn't paying for me or whatever. They want this or whatever. And um, there I can like really kind of go to town and cause you get to know so much more of who they are. So it's a lot more. Um, Material from making fun of them. My boss at my day job has a gap between his two front teeth that has become like his signature thing. And so there have been a couple character artists like Steve Stark is an example of a guy who's who, you know, does free form art for people. He's been doing it for years. And uh, Steve has sent him some custom art that he's made for Joel. And they, you know, they make it so big and prominent in there. And Joel's like, it looks just like me, doesn't it? (laughs) And you're like, it does, Joel. They nailed it. They got you. Uh, Okay, so we've touched on character artists. So tell me about airbrushing. What does that mean? Okay, so I actually learned airbrushing when I first started um, doing caricatures at the West Acres Mall. In 2006, and it's the it's the way that we um, color the caricatures. It's basically a little um, a, a little apparatus, a little tool um, that's hooked up to a compressor. And when you press the button, it pushes the air through the apparatus. And like at the bottom, you hook paint, and then it like sprays the paint. And uh, you know those um fantasy uh, the fantasy art and stuff like that. Like, oh, the, sure, like sure. the fairies and the hobbits are like in that genre. Um, that's all airbrush. Any of like the really amazing graphics you see like on vehicles and stuff like that. Maybe there's like a nature scene or something that's all rendered with airbrushing. Um, but for me, I use it to make fun of people's faces. So, <laughs> so okay, so are you having you're switching the paint out every time or? Oh, well, yeah. Um, I don't usually do airbrush with caricatures now, just with contracts. Like okay. it's generally black and white. Um, but I do airbrush tattooing now, and um, yeah, uh, there are there are uh, apparatuses where you can have um, it's like a manifold, and it sets up like six, six different brushes, and then there's a color for each brush, um, so you don't have to switch out your paints as much, um, 
or what I do, I like, I need to upgrade this year, but I just kind of like clear the brush and then I switch out the paint. But, um, I use, um, adhesive, um, stencils and what? Yeah. Cool. And like, I started like making all my own stencils, but just for like time's sake now, like having the ones with adhesives on it is really handy, but then I can like put down what it looks like a real tattoo. Um, it dries like immediately. It can last for a couple of days. It can last up to a week if you do not shower and you're not in a humid environment. Um, but you can get it, also make it go away right away with some rubbing alcohol. Um, so it's like, mom, look at this. Oh, yeah. You come over no, here right I've now. Actually, <laughs> like when I've done fairs or festival, I had this woman like have me do just like all her whole leg, just like this crazy like snake and skull tattoo, like all down her leg. She just wanted to scare her husband when he got home. <laughs> <laughs> so I've done a few of those. I had years ago, I was at the uh, the first ever Fargo Blues Fest and I got a henna tattoo. Oh, nice. That, that was so cool. And I had them do the Triforce from The Legend of Zelda. <laughs> and I came home and I'm like, Mom, <laughs> check it out. It's so cool. And she's like, you got a tattoo? What place gave you a tattoo? She wasn't mad that I got it. She was more curious that somebody was like, you do not look like you're 18. You look like you're 12. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, no. It's it's going to rub off like eventually. And that thing lasted all summer long. Like whatever pigment was in that thing lasted forever, which was awesome, right? Mm-hmm. Like, because it was only five bucks. And now I get to enjoy it all summer and be like, I got this. No, no big deal. <laughs> this is a Triforce power right here. Uh, okay. And then I noticed that you also on your website, like you do commission work. Mm-hmm. So what does commission work mean for you? Um. Basically, if people want me to art on something, I, I art on it. I, you art on it? I like you art on it. Verb. I love that, yeah. Um, oh, art. someone arted all over the place in here. <laughs> they walk right in. Oh, I got uh, art on my, my shoe as I was walking. Call in. the got, police. Yeah. Someone's been arted in yeah. here. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it's it been a variety of things. It's been a variety of things. Some people want personal caricatures. Other people want me to do mural work of, like, nature scenes. Some people want portrait work. Um, some people... Let's see, nature, mural. And then I have like all of my own like individual like series of art that I do just because it comes from my soul, maybe. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. I like how you're not sure where it comes well, from. Well, can say maybe anything my definitively, soul. but like it really is like the work that just like pulls you, like the stuff that like you're doing, um, you're doing just because like you have this calling or this motivation to do it. And like I, that's very separate from what Alley Cat Studios does like regularly with like the event entertainment. But um, I did definitely um, get a lot of my skills from from doing that. Yeah, it's reps, right? It's you, the more you do it, the more you do it. Oh, the yeah, that's, easier it, that's, it comes. that's the whole point. It's just like one of the things um, that I hear most all caricature artists can like attest to this. Um you're so good at drawing. I can't draw a stick figure. That is such a common statement. People say, I can't draw a stick figure. And the thing is, it's not that you can't. It's that who you are as a person is really, really, really motivated in some other, some, some other thing, like whether it's like scrapbooking or like skate, skateboarding, whatever, like that's where your passion drew you. That's where your attention is. So that's what you're doing all the time. My attention has always been, I'm drawing. It's just repetition. I don't really think that anybody's innately born with the, with like some isolated soul ability to create art. It's like you're born with a motivation to do it. I always tell people like, listen, I'm not very good at drawing, but I've got other really great qualities. Exactly. Like, don't worry about it. Yeah. And that's why the world is a like is a functioning perfect place, right? Because you can excel at that and I can excel at something else exactly. and it takes all types, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly what I mean, yeah. Uh, there's a guy who I work with. Uh, I used to do a morning show with. In fact, Scotch has been a guest on JJ Meets World. And he is, without a doubt, the person I know who has that need to draw inside of him at all times. Mm. And so he's constantly sketching stuff out. He's written like a bunch of d- different comic books. And he's created original characters. And he's done uh homages to other stuff and i'm just amazed because he can sit down and like okay here we go here we go and done and i'll look at that and i'll be like i could never do what you just did i could trace what you did but it still wouldn't look as good as what you've got right here and one of the things that he told me he goes as i got better and better with doodling and like kind of figuring out like okay so you know if i'm gonna draw a female character uh, they need this attributes, you know, to set it aside other than just, you know, like long hair or like a triangle dress, <laughs> to, you know, uh, he said, like the tools I learned to use are better and better. He goes, I still love an ink pen, but 
if I get a, a a pen that has like a fine point on it or like the paint pens and stuff, he goes, it changes what I'm able to do mm-hmm. by having something there that just is meant for that purpose. Yeah. Do you find that? So like when you do a caricature, what are you using to, to create it? Um, Graphite. I use a uh, three and a six millimeter graphite. Um, one for like the inside of the face, touch the mic, and one for the outside of the face. Um, I also use stuff like the Lindian stumps. Um, I try not to ever use an eraser. Like the whole point of caricaturing is it's it, they're quick, fast, clean lines. Um, and y- you push down, it's not sketching. You're not being light or forgiving with it. It's just like every line you put down, you are committing to it. And you're doing it live and you're being really fast with it. So it's very high stakes. Um, yet you don't, you get to a point where you just don't, you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to use use a uh, eraser in general. I took a workshop from Tom Richmond a few years back, and he said because he uh, runs the caricatures at a uh, what is the the entertainment park that's just outside Minneapolis Valley Fair. Valley Fair. He runs the caricatures at Valley Fair, and he was telling us that uh, one time there was a, one of his new like caricature artists was sitting there with his eraser, and he's like, "Oh yeah, let me get see that real quick," and then he just threw it across the park. <laughs> <laughs> kind of really stuck in my head and just like um now I don't really need it at all but back in the day yeah sometimes I just like a cheek line was way off or something and I would need to erase but that's where you need to get really creative because like all of a sudden you're gonna have a beautiful tendril of hair that runs past your face and then off oh there you go so you learn how to like move morph and disguise things in so it's still a clean looking drawing uh but you're you're supposed to get to a point where that's not necessary and um there's caricature artists who use marker and I Absolutely admire you. <laughs> um, you're, it's, you're very brave. It's a, but it, the, the results are absolutely phenomenal, though. But how, that's how long does it take you to do? Like, if you get a single person, they sit down. Like, how long is that caricature taking you um, on on average? Everywhere between four to seven minutes. The variables in there what? are how warmed up I am because after I've been drawing like for like an hour or two straight, like I'm in the zone. I can knock them out in maybe three. Um, if you have like really dark hair like mine, you're wearing all black or something it's automatically going to take longer because I need to get all of this graphite onto the page and that's going to take a while to block in the block in the value. Do you ever have people who like, like bring in like, like your contact at a company and they're like, Hey, we're having our Christmas party and we'd like to bring yeah. you in. And they're like, okay, that's Dawn. Like Dawn, you got to do this. Oh, like yeah. when Dawn's yep. there. Yep. I've definitely had that. I've definitely had a lot of that. Does that do you feel like that's a good thing or does it hinder you? Oh, it's you? awesome. No, yeah. I think that's great. When like when I'm being hired to like entertain your guests, like yeah, give me some inside gags. They're kind of like helping me with my job. Like that's not a problem. Do you like draw Don as a baby and he was like, "That's not fair. <laughs> like why am I always a baby? Come on." Everybody thinks this. What's wrong with me? <laughs> so, where did your love for art come from? I mean, like you, clearly you've been doing it for so long now that it is a part of your soul. It, I just have always, I remember when I was in probably like first grade, I just like, whenever I'd see like magazines or whatever, I would just like draw the things I saw them, saw in them. Um, I drew like this, uh, it was just like some reeds once and my mom saw it and she was just like, oh my God, this is so amazing. She brought it in and showed my first grade teacher, Mrs. Smith. She was like, look what she did. And I think that's where like I got the initial confidence, like, okay, I could do this. And then my great grandfather was a uh, a pretty notable artist um originally from spain but then uh he went over to mexico to do some mural work there and then he moved to southern california and he just did a lot of portraiture work there and he had a painting on the hollywood bowl i think i never actually saw it yeah so he was extra fancy i'm not extra fancy he was extra fancy so um was in your blood yeah arts generally run in my family's blood, like a lot of musicians a lot of visual artists like i play music but not well like i just I'm like, <laughs> you're there for the fun. No, I, do, I that's just for my own personal entertainment, really. <laughs> like, I'm always uh, amazed at like the different mediums that people choose to use over the years. I had a, my first grade teacher is a woman named Karen Colstead or Susan Colstead, excuse me, who loved art and had the full belief of like, listen, this is inside of everyone. It just blossoms, you know, fuller with, you know, everybody. Mm-hmm. And so like, Every month we made a wind sock and she used different things. Like she's like, okay, we're going to use uh, watercolors this month. But, you know, if you sprinkle salt onto the watercolor, you get this really neat like pattern and design. 
And then the next time she's like, okay, we're going to make a windsock that looks like us. And, you know, so, and then you get to bring it home, right? And then you make your parents hang it up outside and it only lasts one rainstorm because it's all made out of, you know, construction paper. Uh, But Susan was amazing. And Susan has gone on since she retired from teaching to working with children at the Roger Maris Cancer Center. And so while they're doing like um, a chemo treatment or something, she does these art projects with them kind of, you know, to to distract a little bit, but also, you know, to be like, listen, you know, they, there's a reason why we get up every day and it's for this purpose. And I, I like, I'm amazed by her just with that idea. And so the idea that you're going into art therapy is really intriguing to me too. So wh- what does that look like? Um, so it's like, it, it's talk therapy, but you're also, bringing forth um different um different materials depending on each person um and you're having them render like different kinds of art i think the idea okay preface i'm having a i got a minor in art therapy and mm-hmm. i'm going in to master's degree to get like more of a better understanding of cool. how exactly to do it but basically you have people do art as a way to get their emotions out without having having to go through the different areas in your brain, <clears throat> excuse me, that get kind of blocked up by trauma. Like you don't want to be able, if you don't want to talk about, okay, good example. Um, we had a art therapist come in and talk for one of my classes and she was talking about being an art therapist for people who uh, in another country who uh, were going through war and she was working with children and she was just having the children. She didn't even give them any like prompts or anything she was just like just go ahead and just like draw how you feel and most of them drew um violence blood dismemberment stuff like that because that's what's in their that's what's in their unconscious mind that's what's in their conscious mind that's what's in their psyche they're not talking about it but they're getting it out because like when you let stuff like just live in you without ever talking about it and talking about things can be really hard actually saying the words all the mental processes that have to happen for you to actually get that out of your mouth can be very challenging or you can just go and splatter a bunch of paper or a bunch of paint on paper or you can just like make a really weird little clay uh, amorphous grotesque looking thing that represents how you feel in your soul right now or whatever. Right. Like, sure. So um, I would like to preface with, I am not completely trained in this yet. So, <laughs> so I don't have all of the answers for well, it. I'm but. not asking like for a free session. So, Oh no, uh, I guess I was just more Because you got to get out of my hand. <laughs> no, if there's any art therapists out there, don't worry. I'm not practicing <laughs> yet. I still have like a few years <laughs> of education. Uh, yeah. I, I, can work Im- on. I can imagine like unlocking that subconscious by like giving someone a person, uh, uh, like a chunk of clay. Right. And then they're talking about like, yeah, you know, I think things are going pretty good in my relationship, but then they split the clay into two pieces and they keep pushing them farther mm-hmm. apart and be like, are you really? Yeah, are you? Is that what's happening? Yeah, yeah. Oh, one of the one of the prompts uh, we we work with prompts a lot. Um, one of the prompts would be like you do a like just a squiggle on the paper, and then you just look at it and say, okay, so what do you see in that squiggle? And then like whatever's going on in your head, you're gonna start to impression. When I did it, I saw a mother and a child, but I have I have two girls, so that like. That was something like that was in my head. My my children are in my head. So like the first thing I saw was a mother like lovingly, lovingly embracing her baby. Um, somebody else might have seen a uh, uh, what was that on motocross? A sure, motocross yeah, event. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> is, that's what they're into. It it is intriguing that people can walk up. So we have a a a painting from an artist in Illinois that uh, my wife's uncles gave us in our um, living room, and it's abstract, but it's it's supposed to be, or you can tell that like the abstract aspect of it is like all the colors and design, but it's supposed to be a stump from where a tree used to be in a forest somewhere. Mm-hmm. And when I look at it, I can see this kind of like demonic figure coming out of the stump where, you know, like shards of it, you know, become the horns because it's very symmetrical in two areas, but then nowhere else. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, oh, yeah. that. and Jill will look at that and she'll look, go like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, what do you see when you look up there? And she's like, well, it looks like a dinner table, duh. And I'm like, dinner table? What? <laughs> Where do you get that? And that's one of the things that intrigues me a lot when it comes to just art in general is that 
there is a deeper meaning depending on what you have going on at that moment. Like if, if you, those drawings where it's like, what do you see first? Mm-hmm. And it is, you know, a picture of an old woman, but there's also a picture of a young woman in yep. there. And it's what, you know, whatever your brain is able to process first with those yeah. like images. Yeah. Do you ever uh, find yourself going through and like being like, I, I love this artist and you seek out more of what they're doing and it just you can you just can't get it out of your mind. Um yeah, I'm actually dealing with that right now. Um there is a the, it's I'm doing a series on human rights, so it gets a uh, kind of cool. I don't know I don't know how how serious we're making this. You can interview. absolutely let's make it serious. Uh, um there so like I uh had to do a uh, pretty big uh, paper on an artist and I chose Ana Mandietta who was a, she was a performance artist. She was studying, um, she was in a uh, master's degree for painting. And then a a young woman on her campus was assaulted, um, raped and murdered. Um, And there was pretty much it like in her dorm, in her dorm. And there was pretty much, even this was in Iowa in the 1970s. And uh, there was pretty much no media on it. Nobody was talking about this. And so she, um, Basically, completely, she'd spent so many years dedicated to painting, and she just took a hard flank, and immediately she got into, like, more performance art. Like, the first thing she created after that was just still shots of her face with blood running down them. She yeah, she used a lot of uh, actual animal blood in her work, and it was representative of basically um, violence towards women, um, the unspoken narrative of violence towards women. And she was kind of a... Uh, a trendsetter, somebody who's like first making it, like giving a voice to this phenomenon that was happening because so many women go missing, they get murdered. They, there's so much, uh, so much, so much happens and we, and there was no real narrative for it then. So um, she used her work to be absolutely shocking, absolutely visceral because she wanted to get people's attention. And she was very successful at doing that um, until she died of an early death Um being ejected out of her uh, window. Um, well, supposedly her uh, husband says that she was just, he was just, she was just so mad that he was a better artist that she flung herself out a window. The doorman says that she heard, he heard a woman screaming and saying no um, before she fell. Mm. And then he, like they tried to charge him three times, but he eventually got off. He was a popular artist. His name was Carlos Andre. Um, there's still retrospectives um, in New York on him. And then there's still groups of uh, artists that, show up and do um, protests of uh, protests to be like, why are we still representing? Everybody knows what happened. Why is this still happening? So it was like tragically ironic because she was advocating for pretty much the same way that she went. And uh, yeah, I think that's absolutely. um, That's a fascinating story. Yeah. And like, I'm, I'm an indigenous American and there's this phenomenon It's not a phenomenon. It's just something that's been happening for a really long time of missing and murdered indigenous women. And it's not talked about very much. And there's not there. There there isn't the the attention that needs to go to it. So right now I'm working on a series of human rights. Some of it has to do with what's going on with the violence towards African-Americans. And the other part of it has just really been about like um, people, the indigenous people like we're getting um, pipelines run through our reservations where women are going missing. Um, it's, it's, it's an absolute atrocity what's happening to people. And, um, so yeah, so I've been doing just so much research and I've been rendering so much art for this exhibition and, uh, it's very depressing. I'm kind of bummed out lately. I'm not very fun to talk to usually. I think, I, and you know, I think that's one we thing. We disagree. That, you are fun to talk oh, okay. to. Yeah. <laughs> you, it, uh, but it is difficult, right? Like if you get bogged down into something that you feel is incredibly important, but it's hard to deal with. You know, I think the same thing goes for, you know, if you've got a, uh, uh, like a, a, a defense attorney, like a court appointed defense attorney, right? Who has is constantly trying to help people out. And they're working in a system that is built a, a, to against their clients, you know, because they're not wealthy and they're not affluent. And they're people who are in a state of absolute need and crisis. Mm-hmm. And our best option is like, well, we'll just put you in prison for a little bit. You know, you're going to be fine there. Yep. That'll fix everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think of like like when Dapple was happening and we had all this national media attention like coming and then like 
they're they're gone, right? They where are the follow-ups? Where are the pieces to say like, okay, what what is this pipeline doing at this point? Um I get it, it bo- uh, national media bothers me because they love to show up and they love to get their sound bite, but then they don't leave anything uh, in the in the you know recesses. They mm-hmm. like it's come and gone. It's like a, a, a snake oil salesman coming and like trying to fleece as much as he can out of a town and then get out before everyone realizes it's poison. Yeah, I see. It, I saw that like in the flood, like in uh, 2009 and 2010. You know, all of a sudden, Good Morning America is sending a film crew out here, but no one from the film crew is helping sandbag. But they're like, "Could you stop sandbagging for a minute so that we can, you know, get a piece of here <laughs> where everyone's eating a burrito? Like, would that be possible?" And I, it, maybe it's just because the older I get, the more jaded I become when it comes to media. But it I, does it. It's it, it's good for you for making th- these things that are going to spark conversation and maybe action too. Well, like if we like, I don't think it's that you're becoming more jaded. I think the older we get, we have an option to become more aware of what's going on. And um, good for you for like recognizing and acknowledging that stuff. Cause it's really hard. Cause we're so busy all the time and we're running to pay our bills and all of this stuff. And it's hard to take on the burdens of other people, but it's just, we are all one people. If our neighbor is suffering, we are suffering. And I don't know what it's going to take for us to on a mass level, like shift into that consciousness. But once we do, it's going to get so much better if we're all truly taking care of ourselves. Like we're taking care of our family, like we're t- t- taking care of, our neighbors, like we were taking care of people in other countries. Like if we just care and know that everything, if it happens to somebody else, it has happened to you in one way or another, it is still affecting the whole human, the the whole um, human consciousness. Last night I emceed a thing called the sweetheart ball for the Ronald McDonald house. Oh, yeah. And up until four years ago, when I first got involved with the Ronald McDonald mm-hmm. house, all I knew was, well, they want my coins if I'm driving through McDonald's. Like, they want my change in the collection basket for it. And I didn't know really what they did and what they served. And last night, I listened to a woman tell a story about how when her son was di- at age seven was diagnosed with, like, an intense form of cancer oh, that were causing, like, he had to have, like, spinal taps and, like, all of this stuff. And she said, we ended up spending 91 days at the Ronald McDonald house for free. Yeah. And she goes, if we had had to have the burden of having to pay for a hotel while we were here, there'd be the question of like, okay, well, the family's going to be separate for all of this time. And my husband will have to stay back at our home and take care of these four kids rather than all of us being able to be together. And then I heard the story of there's a woman who gave birth to quadruplets and they were all immediately, they were extremely premature and they had to be put in these isolates and they spent six months living at the Ronald McDonald house. And so when we're wrapping up this thing, you know, at the end of the night, clearly it's a fundraiser for them, but it's, you're saying like, listen, if you were able to give $50 tonight, you made it possible for a family to stay together in a time when the last thing that they should have to concentrate on is like, exactly. where are we going to find a place to sleep yeah, tonight? Exactly. The Ronald McDonald house was huge for my sister when Dane was born because my nephew has special needs. And so I actually went and stayed because he was at a children's hospital in the NICU for about three months. And right across the street was a Ronald McDonald house, uh, you know, it was basically a nice like new hotel. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to go visit, we stayed there. And so, yeah, it was my first only time I've ever been inside of one before. I'd always heard the stories. I knew kind of the mission statement, Um, but then being there with our family and then seeing all these other families and every family, like you were seeing families from every walk of life, every like culture and every economic status and everything, like everyone was there and you could see everyone's, you could tell how much good it was doing for these families to not have to think about what am I eating today and where am I sleeping tonight? Yeah. Because they had to have all this emotional mental baggage for, you know, their their little kid that's across the street in the hospital for whatever reason. Yeah. And it, oh I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna I was just gonna agree with what you're saying. Like it gives it gives you I, it's weird to say opportunity, but like to just solely focus on what is happening right now with your family and not have like this uh the, like this fear of like we're gonna run out of money, all of these all these other external things that people have to deal with while they're dealing with tragedy. So, mm-hmm. and then the people who were in that room last night, I thought to myself, Tucker's got a great saying, and I'm gonna make him say it in a second. But like, they are making sure that a family that they probably will never meet and never know about 
is comforted. So like helping neighbors. What's the thing that you say about planting a tree? Oh, it's plant. It's not my fr- I forget who coined it first, but it's planting trees under the shade of which you will never rest. Right. So it's 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 doing something that you know will benefit a generation beyond you and won't benefit you directly. And it's a truly selfless act because you get nothing out of it. I, I forget who originally coined that phrase. Well, um, um, in well, in indigenous cultures, that's generally something that's baseline thought about. How is this going to affect generations that go on? How is this going to affect my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, my um, my great great grandchildren? Like that's why uh, they. We, we protect, try to protect the land, try to keep it sacred, try to hold it with care because there's so many people coming ahead of us, so many people that are connected to who we are. And if we are, well, I've got this awesome, like, giant vehicle and I'm working for Chevron and I'm doing this and that and I'm making all the money. It's just like, yeah, but you're stealing the resources for your great grandchildren. They're not going to be able to breathe very clean air and they're going to be wearing masks even without a pandemic happening. This is, we've got to think, we have to think that we have to be aware that that is happening. We have to be aware that what we do now, our great grandchildren are going to look back at us and they're going to be proud of us or they're going to be mad or they're going to be dead. Right. Yeah. I, Every it, it, not a week goes by where I don't read an article where it says like, well, this is what we've set for 2050 by 2050. If we do not make drastic changes, even beyond the changes we've tried to make at this point, we are going, you know, water will become more valuable than mm-hmm. gold. Yeah. Um, or the fact of the matter is, is that we won't have as much, you know, land is so important to people, right? Like, yeah. oh, you got to invest in real estate. Uh, but what happens when the polar ice caps melt and we don't have coasts anymore and Fargo becomes beachfront territory? Mm-hmm. Uh, it is it is a terrifying thing. And like my wife and I are like getting ready to start a family soon. And I'm thinking about that all the time. But like, OK, so if my kids live to be 80, what will the world really mm-hmm. look like at that point? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's terrifying. And all I'm going to leave behind is a really great, great caricature that I got from you one day. So, um, you know, I, I, I need to find it, but I, I had a character drawn of me. This has been 1993 or 1994. And I was a kid who um, I did not, I, I still don't like photos of me, right? Like there's not a ton of pictures of me on Facebook because I'm not constantly posing and getting into people's photos and stuff. And as a kid, I was really self-conscious of how I looked. And I got a character drawn and it was the only photo of me that I actually liked. Oh, nice. And so I had it framed. I got to go back and find it now. But I, I remember something about um, I, I was really self-conscious about my neck, thinking my neck was too fat. Like, oh, this is gross. Right. My superheroes, they don't have a neck that looks like this. Right. <laughs> you know, and I think the character artist drew me with a skinny neck and like a big acorn shaped head. <laughs> and for some reason, I thought this is the ideal look for me. <laughs> and so that was like the only photo I had on the wall. I'm going to have to track that down now and make that my Facebook uh, social media. <laughs> like, it might still be my favorite photo of me. One of our frequent listeners, Natalie, will know that my the best character I've ever gotten was in Las Vegas. And it was Natalie and I. And it was perfect because... It was a kiosk in the middle of, you know, like a a walkway somewhere. And so while we're getting our caricature, a friend of ours was getting a massage, like a chair massage that he was incredibly uncomfortable having. Like you could see it in his face that they were maybe going a little too high up on his inner thigh for his (laughs) like comfortable, you know, like level. And so the laughs that we gave our artists were so genuine and so real. That's the best. You get the best caricatures if you're like really smiling. Yeah. Like if you can only give me that, that really like stagnant fake kind of smile, it's not even reaching your eyes and just hold it like that. Like it'll work. But if you just like have like that full, like on like joy, that mm-hmm. joyful expression for, if you can have that for like four minutes, you're going to get an amazing, you're going to oh, amazing drawing. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so the 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 stuff that you're doing for like live events and things like that. Mm-hmm. If someone's listening and they're like, "I gotta book this right now," how are they gonna find you? Um. Well, you can go to alleycatstudios.com. A l i k a t studios.com. You can go to Instagram. I have an artist page there. That's alleycat underscore studios. Um. I have a Facebook page. I'm I'm everywhere. Um. Alleycat Studios Facebook page. Um. 
If you go to my website, though, you can like hit the contact. You can even like put in what you want and then hit the contact and then that goes straight to my work email. Really? So it's awesome. Yeah. I've wanted to do this thing where like, so my sister just moved into a new house and my in-laws resided their house up in Hillsboro. And I was like, you know, it'd be a really neat like holiday gift is to hire an artist to do an interpretation of all of these homes that I could, you know, then frame and then they could hang it up in their house. Years and years and years ago, my mom hired someone who did uh, like really fine pencil drawings and did fine like of my grandfather's lake cabin. Mm-hmm. And then she turned it into stationery. And we still like I still have a piece of that like sitting framed on my desk. Nice. And I, I thought it was just so, so cool and so neat. And, you know, whatever, you know, whatever house, whatever dwelling that you use uh, to be safe right now is something that I think people really like enjoy and they become very proud of that yeah. space too. And so I think having something like that. So uh, I'll remember Alley Cat, A-L-I-K-A-T. Yeah. Okay. Alley Cat Studios. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do you, what's the most uh, you've ever done in a day for characters, do you think? Like um, after you get really rolling. Oh, how many I've drawn? Yeah. Um, I never count how many, but it, sometimes I'm averaging maybe like three to four minutes a face. So if you divide that by 60, multiply that number by how many hours you would get what? the amount. No carpal tunnel or anything like um, that? When I got a contract with the Fargo Force um, up until uh, COVID and uh, I was doing it so like I was at a lot of games. So I was doing it so regularly that I started to get a like a little bit of like tension yeah. in my arm, started to feel it stiffening in my hand. So I had to learn like the, I had to learn the carpal tunnel um, <laughs> exercises and all of that. And it's really important when you're a visual artist too, that you like when you're, when you're rendering you just a whole good posture because you can really mess yourself up if you don't. I, sure. I mean, it's even as simple as just tensing, tensing your hand too much. Like just last night I was doing dishes and I must've been, I was listening to music at the same time. So I think I was like, must have been washing them intensely. But after a bit, my right, right hand just started to hurt. And I realized I was just tensing my right hand too much. Yeah. And I pinched it. I could totally see that being something that happens to a character artist. Um, I also like, uh, I know a few masseuses and they always talk about how when they're like working on someone's back, they're putting their whole body into it. Like they found ways to leverage the physics of their body. See, that's what you need to do. Yes. So are you, are you always se- seated? Or are you ever like standing? And oh, like- when I'm caricaturing, I'm, se- I'm definitely seated, okay. but like I try to sit straight up aligned posture and like not get too close to the page and just have my arm out. But a lot of times I catch myself um, by the end of the drawing, like my face is almost at the drawing board and I'm like really oh. getting into it. So I, I keep losing my posture and correcting my posture, losing and correcting. Cause I, you know, we're all a work in progress. I here, find so. that that happens to me every <laughs> single time I dive into an edit on a video or something. I start like really ergonomically sound. Yep. And within an hour I realized I'm completely hunched <laughs> over. My legs are, are crisscross applesauce up in my chair yep. and I'm like right next and my back hurts and everything hurts. And yep. I realized, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm these, these terrible, terrible habits that I've been in for years. I let our dog sleep in my bed. And so they get to pick the spot first. And then I kind of form around whatever they are. And uh-huh. then I wake up with a horrible backache <laughs> like every day. Uh, this has been so much fun getting to talk with you today. And like, it's, it, it's just a very unique experience to talk to someone who embraces art the way that you do and has a, a thrive for making future generations uh, happier with us rather than mad. So uh, again, let's give your website out an, one more time, just in case. Um, it's a L I K A T studios, pluralized studios.com. And you're accepting bookings and everything right oh, yeah. now? We're open for good. We're open for bookings. Fantastic. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'll see you at the next post prom. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to wrap it up for today's show. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to help us continue to produce new episodes each week, visit jjmeetsworld.com where you can donate to our Patreon, pick up some swag at the merch shop, or follow our link to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all the sites the cool kids are using these days. JJ Meets World is produced every week by Tucker Lucas. You can find out more about Tucker's work by visiting moonbasemaria.com. If you want to get in touch with your host with the most, check out linebenders.com where you can find direct contact info for JJ or booking information. Well, it turns out that uh, Natalie didn't want me to share that image online. So I'm going to make sure to hit all our social media accounts. 